This is my partner in crime, Patrice Shell. She's doing all our tech stuff and she really <laughs> has done a great job. So I just want to thank you for being here um, and to attend our presentation today. And probably most of you know the restroom's right up there. And I'd ask you to please turn off your phones before we get started. Uh, this uh, presentation will be recorded and shared virtually. So we'll have some folks online. She's blocking the camera. I'm not that. <laughs> That's what I do. Um, and it'll be available, uh, the recording will be available on the week's website. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots volunteer organization dedicated to voter education and empowerment without endorsing any political party or candidate. Further information on this event and others are at www.lwb-uv.org. So some of you might recall, Chris came to Montrose a few years ago to discuss Colorado's tax structure and issues contributing to and rising from cost of living in the state. And so once again, the League of Women Voters of the Uncombe Harbor Valley is proud to bring you Mr. Chris Kedlick of the Colorado Principal Institute. But he's also worked as a high school Latin teacher, hiked the Colorado Trail and climbed all of Colorado's 14,000 foot peaks. He does his best writing after weekend trips back and packing in Colorado's wilderness away from self service. Christopher got his start explaining economics in 2009, writing an explanatory economic color for his small hometown newspaper in Bedford, Pennsylvania. Colin was geared at explaining complicated economic discussions in simple metaphorical terms so you can listen to them. Uh, that everyone can understand, and he would be able to do that. His published works included two children's books titled An Igloo Half Made and A World Named Bedford, and an economics book titled Economics in Other Words What Your Boring Economics Professor Try to Teach. So we're really lucky, and welcome, please. So I was drinking a top there earlier, and Jan thought I was getting drunk before and I bought here. It's a soda, it's a Zuber Fizz fact soda. I'm not drinking beer in front of my uh, uh, I'm an economics professor. I have a background in labor economics, microeconomics, finance. So I'm able to answer important questions, like important questions like this one. <laughs> but why is there Braille on drive-up ATMs? <laughs> Anyone know? Maybe the best person on the best seat. Oh, yeah, maybe. Harder to do than that, yeah. Because obviously blind can't drive, right? And you're not supposed to be walking up to those driver ones, particularly if you're blind, because you're walking in traffic. But why would ATMs have Braille then? To start thinking like an economist. It doesn't cost too much money. To, they're already pre-made. They're pre-made. They have to have a walk-up ones. It makes no sense to have two keypads. The ATM companies make one set of keypads that work for both. Oh. Right? It's not because blind people drop it. Well, hopefully not. Uh -huh. Good. <laughs> How about this one? Why is milk sold typically in rectangular containers and soda is sold in round? Or beer bottle round? Like you know what? Round is easier to hold. Yeah. Why would a milk be want to be easier to hold? Better to put on the shelf. Yeah. Keep going. Keep yeah. going. What's that mean? Because you can, they can stop more. They can stop more. So why would you make soda square then? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Does it? <clears throat> What's the difference between milk and soda? Sugar. Well, that was a lot. To probably. <laughs> Oh, we have to be refrigerated. Uh, uh, so shelf space is more expensive. So you want to maximize shelf space with milk. Soda can be shipped warm, right? So you figure out how much shelf space you lose if you're circled. 
You don't want to waste that if you're paying for refrigerated shelf space. Because things like this, you start thinking like an economist, you can answer these things and win yourself a soda at the bar sometime. <laughs> How about this one? Baseball fans? There's statistically more hit, batters get hit more in the American League than the National League. Why would more pitchers hit batters in the American versus National? They have to do the park. Not the park. Slight different in rules, which changed recently. But in the National League, the pitcher has to bat. In the American League, there's a designated hitter. Pitcher doesn't bat. So they don't have to face retaliation. <laughs> so statistically, they actually hit more batters knowing they're not going to get hit when they bat the next time. So the economic questions like this, I teach in my economics class. I've been teaching it for eight, eight, eight years. I teach at 8 a.m. So I have to figure out how to make funny examples and bring, bring cartoons. Otherwise, I lose my students. But today's kind of lecture is all about Colorado's fiscal situation. So I have a lot of questions I want to answer, and the kind of the structure of the talk is I'm going to give you a background on how taxes work, how our state budget works, how our property taxes work, how our schools work, and, we'll, and how they do our elections work. And that will set up a discussion of like why are property taxes so high? Are we going to be here till like 10 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> I only got three hours of material. <laughs> So we're, I'm going to try to answer why are property taxes so high, or why they spiked last year. We'll understand how assessment rate works, how mills work, how our local governments fund our property taxes. That's one of the things we we'll answer at the end of the three hours. <laughs> what about my table rebate? Remember two years ago we were mailed checks, seven hundred fifty dollar checks. Uh, this year we got eight hundred dollars back individually from Tabor if you filed your taxes. How much are we going to get next year? We'll talk about how those work, how Tabor works, why we're getting so much money back from the state government. Okay, we'll answer that question. Some of you might be interested in the homestead exemption. That's that special property tax break for people who are 65 and older and who have lived in their home for 10 years. Yeah. Um, it was passed in 2000. A lot of people would like to update it or make it affordable. So if you shift houses, you get to take it with you. We'll talk about where that's at in legislative session right now. Um, and we'll also talk about uh, if we're still cutting, making cuts to our schools. Since 2009, there's a thing called the budget stabilization factor. It basically cut state funding to schools when we hit our last recession. And this year, after 15 years of underfunding compared to what we voted on, we're finally paying back, uh, basically even out how much we owe our schools. We'll talk about a, little, a deep dive into school finance in the third hour of the lecture. <laughs> there is a bathroom up there. <laughs> <laughs> a reminder. That's great. That's good. <laughs> so, Colorado Fiscal we do a lot of research on taxes, school finance. We also do a lot of research on how to best talk about taxes. And what the focus groups say is you got to get away from chart numbers and graphs. Because people's eyes glaze over and they say this stuff is way too complicated. I'm glad someone else has to understand it. Okay, so I'm trying to get away from charts, numbers, and graphs. As you can see from my first several slides, I haven't figured out quite how to do that yet. Which sucks because this complicated stuff is we need to understand because we as voters decide all this stuff on the bottom of the back. Um, we have to understand what mills are and assessment rates are and how our schools are funded. I spent a lot of fall last year talking about Proposition HH. Remember that one? Super complicated. And what I learned is no one knows what mills are. No one knows how property taxes work. No one knows like anything about property taxes. And so HH was super complicated. I basically spent the months explaining it to people. But we'll talk about that at, at the end of the lecture and why uh, it failed. And what the legislative did, the legislature did in a special session compensate uh, the, the Prop HH not pass. Okay? So here's the, this is the background of the state budget. It's like $35 billion. There's three basic big chunks of the state budget. There's the federal funds. That's money we get from Congress for Medicaid, for our highways, for higher education. We don't really have any control over those dollars. Then there's the cash funds. 
Cash funds, when you hear cash funds, think fees. So a great example of a cash fund would be like a car registration fees. If you have a driver's license or a registered car, you pay registration fees, they pay for your roads and bridges. There's a direct connection between what you're paying for and what you're getting. Car registration fee, pay for road. Okay? Those are the cash fund fees. You can't like feed a hunter and use it to pay for schools. That wouldn't work. That's what the general fund is for. So when you're really talking about the state budget, we're talking about the general fund. That's really where all our collective taxes go. Mm -hmm. So when we file our income tax, all our income tax goes to the general fund. About 30% of the general fund is sales tax. So think of the general fund as our collective pot of money where we as Coloradans throw our taxes. Okay? Sales tax are more complicated because a lot of them are local versus state. So if you buy anything, Montrose or Denver or Evergreen, everyone pays 2.9% state sales tax. That's the stuff that goes to the general fund. But then depending on which county, city, regional transportation district you're in, your sales tax widely varies. Mm. But this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the state general fund, the 2.9%. If you're curious, don't buy your ski goggles in Winter Park. <laughs> Highest uh, sales tax in the state, 11.2. Uh -huh. um, but I got my stimulus check from COVID. I went and bought an $800 green egg smoker. <laughs> but I drove up to Evergreen's Ace Hardware because Evergreen's Ace Hardware <laughs> is only 4.5% compared to my Denver's 8.8. Uh -huh. uh -huh. so, I think, think Montrose City's 8 point something. It's probably around there. I mean, it's, uh, the, the lower ones have unincorporated. They don't have cities to actually pay for so. And, and Winter Park is super hot because they don't have much property tax because they have a ski resort, which is not taxed. And the town doesn't have much property. But typically, you know, we have high, high sales tax in like tourist areas, ski resorts areas. Winter Park. But from those taxes, for every dollar you gave Colorado in taxes last year, do you know where they went? For every cent you gave Colorado, how many cents of that tax dollar went to schools? Or roads, or courts, higher education, human services. What do you think? League of Women Voters should be educated on this stuff. <laughs> Where's your tax? What's the biggest chunk of our tax dollar? <laughs> What's it paying for from the general fund? Human services. Human services? Good guess. Oh, I think schools. But... You're saying schools? Well, <laughs> security. <laughs> You say police? Mm -hmm. About healthcare. Healthcare? Healthcare second. Okay. Police, a lot of police is local. This must be your dentist, your monitors, police, or sheriff, or your dental police. That's more of a local government thing. Okay. We have highway patrol, but not really much police in the state budget. Roads. Roads? It actually is schools. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, no one ever says schools because when you rank our like starting teacher salary, we're like really low on the bottom of the list. Um, our per pupil funding is kind of in the 40s, so we're kind of below the average in per pupil funding. But it's the biggest chunk of our general. Or think of it another way every dollar you get all around in taxes, about 33 cents go to schools. Your, your healthcare chunk, which is mostly Medicaid. So we're talking health care for low-income folks, for disabled elderly populations on Medicaid, not Medicare. Medicaid is about 30%, or 30 cents of our dollar goes to Medicaid. So it's the second biggest. And then you got three departments that are similar in size every year. Your prisons, your career, oh, sorry, your prisons, your higher ed, and your human services. Um, and then everything else gets lumped in and gets about 11%. Notice there's not much road funding, right? Sometimes in really good years, we give some of our money from the general fund to roads, but the primary funding source of roads is the gas tax. So if you put a gallon of gas, for it's for $3.10 or something, of that $3.10, 25 cents of it is the gas tax per gallon. That's our primary funding source for roads. We don't give much of our general fund to roads. Okay. Any surprises up there? As much, as much goes to education K twelve, I thought, and I know that we are way low on higher 
I remember looking at per pupil finally we're like 47th or 48th on the actual per pupil, yeah. And then when you do this lecture in schools, they're already always mad that the higher ed is similar to corrections. Like you're spending as much to jail people as you are offsetting my tuition. Yeah. If you look at this pie 20 years ago, healthcare was a lot smaller chunk, higher ed was a lot bigger chunk. Uh, the kind of the, the aging population of people moving on to Medicaid, moving into nursing homes is a bigger part of our state budget uh, today than it was 25 years ago. My tuition was a hundred, one hundredth of what it is. Right? Yeah. At, at CU. Oh. Now it's a 99, I suppose, when it's on. A few years ago. <laughs> so that's the state budget, but there, it gets more complicated because we fund our schools both locally and from state sources. So to look at the whole school finance, state sources kick in about $5 billion. But that was only 55% of overall school funding last year. 45% comes from local property taxes. These are your property taxes in each of the school districts around here. Uh, the big story is this the growth in property taxes the last several years? This chunk of the pie has grown significantly. And it's one of the reasons I'll argue why we're able to better fund our schools in the last several years is because we're kicking in a lot more local, local property taxes. Because the growth in our value of our homes has gone up significantly. Mm -hmm. This is the state pie. This looks differently depending if you're in Montrose versus Aspen versus Pueblo versus Cherry Creek in Denver. Overall state pie is about 55 45. I show Aspen and Pueblo because they're mirror opposites. Pueblo does not have million dollar ski condos. Aspen does. Aspen can generate a lot of money locally from their local property taxes. Uh, and then the state backfills about a quarter of funding for Aspen through state sources. Now, Pueblo is about the exact opposite, it only generates about a quarter locally. The state kicks in about three quarters. Hmm. So that the school finance formula compensates between wealth, property wealth across districts. Montrose, any guess on where Montrose is at? Closer to Pueblo or closer to Aspen? It's about 34% local. But still getting about two thirds uh, Montrose County School District from the state. Um, now, it, depending on which district you're in, some districts have a casino or a lot of commercial property or you know a lot more business property. You all about 42% residential, so a little bit more residential than, than the rest of the state. Um, yes, yeah, so you're kind of right, right in the middle between a little bit more from the state than the overall average. But if you look at this funding pie from six years ago, it used to be a lot less local. So notice the purple, the 36%. This is 2018. It was 64% state, 36% local. A lot of that is the fact that our property taxes have really gone up in the last several years, which we'll talk about why in a second. But that has really benefited the school funding buy because you're kicking in about 900 million more than what you were several years ago. So that means more of the pie for schools is local, which means it frees up more money for the state the general fund to do other things. So if we're like, colleges are happy that property taxes are up because locals cover more of the state of, of schools and then there's more money in the general fund for say colleges. So even though colleges don't get any property tax really, they're rooting for higher property taxes because the school finance for them. Okay. I'll argue, I mean, local property taxes was about 2.1 billion in 2018 Last year was 3.9 billion. So bigger, a lot bigger chunk of our funding for schools has gone because of property taxes that have really gone up. If you really get in the weeds and have four hours with me, I would do an extra hour on school finance. Uh, so if you're interested in the school finance budget, and a lot of it, I'll, show, I'll shout out to our purple book. There's a big, there's a, some of this in our, our purple book. Um, but the really the, the timeline of understanding school finance, just to give you an idea, would really start in 1982. 1982, constitutional amendment called the Gallagher Amendment. 
The Gallagher Amendment, we'll talk about in a second. It basically said we're going to keep property taxes on homes from, from growing too fast. That's the Cliff Notes version of Gallagher. Tabor comes in 10 years later. We'll talk about Tabor in a second. Our school finance formula hasn't been updated since 1994. So a lot of people would like to modernize or update our school finance formula, but basically how we distribute our money across 178 districts hasn't been, cha hasn't been changed or updated since 94. Mm. It's also the same year in the movie Dumb and Dumber came out. My favorite movie, one of my favorite movies. <laughs> And then basically, we have a really good economy in the 90s, but we are losing ground in per pupil funding with our schools. And so voters voted on Amendment 23 back in 2000. They said, we want to prioritize education in the budget. And they locked in Amendment 23 into our state constitution. They basically said, we're going to keep our pupil, per pupil funding up. It's going to continue to grow by inflation. So that had basically this idea of prioritizing education in the general fund. And then the next step in the school finance world is basically we hit the recession in 2009. You know, people lost their jobs. If they lose their jobs, they're not paying sales tax, they're not paying income tax. So the last recession we hit, we lost 15% of our revenue. Hmm. Well, they were trying to run the school finance formula that year, and they said, hey, we got to get to about $4 billion to match what voters said with Amendment 23. We only got about $3 billion. And when they invented this accounting trick called the negative factor, that basically is a negative pot of money they took from school districts from what they would have got if they were matching Amendment 23 levels. And so every year since 2009, we've been short the Amendment 23 level. If you're really into the school finance stuff in Colorado, it's known as the negative factor. Okay? This is the first year we're going to actually fully fund uh, Amendment 23 net levels. And that's equivalent of saying we're going to zero out the negative factor this year. If you ever heard that term or pull us ranting or bragging about zeroing the negative factor, think of that as the shortfall that we've made every year in our school finance budget of where we would have been funding at Amendment 23 levels. Do they carry over those and all those negatives? No. They just ignore them. Well, it's, I mean, it's like six or seven billion dollars in aggregate. Yeah. But like they'll never get not like we're just gonna find seven billion dollars somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, at least at least the annual shortfall isn't more. Okay. And then there's your history of the negative factor. Again, it was almost a, it was a billion dollars several several years, um, and we've, in the last several, we've slowly been able to eat a lot of that negative factor back, which means we're getting closer to those Amendment 23 levels that voters said we want to be funding. And I'll, I'll argue that a lot of this was because of property taxes, big growth in property taxes. Okay, that's my quick background in school finance. Then you got to go back around in Tabor. Tabor is a taxpayer bill of rights. We added to our state constitution in 1992. Uh, the recent polling on Tabor says only about a third of people know what Tabor is, and a handful of them thought it was a shopping mall in Denver. <laughs> More people know about Tabor now because they've got significantly large Tabor rebate checks. Um, but if people know anything about Tabor, they know that I'm getting a rebate check sometimes, and you can't raise taxes without a vote of the people. Okay, there are several other major provisions of Tabor you got to talk about. But think about our legislators can't raise taxes. They can raise fees, they just can't raise general taxes without going to a vote. That in every school district, every fire district, every library district, every county, every state budget, nothing can go up, no rate can go up without a vote. That's a big provision of Tabor. Tabor also limits what types of taxes we're allowed to have. Like it specifically outlaws, like a uh, we can't have a statewide property tax. We can't have a graduated income tax. Like most states have higher rates of higher income earners. Colorado says our tax has to be flat because of Tabor. So there's certain types of taxes that Tabor outlaws. Tabor sets election provisions 
tells us when we vote on taxes, the ballot language that has to go on the ballot when we vote on taxes. What can we vote on even in odd years? So there's a part of Tabor that talks about how we vote on taxes. And then finally, Tabor caps how big government can grow each year. And it caps government to grow by inflation plus population growth. So prices, like prices went up 5% this year, population was about 1%, that cap can grow by 6%. And then all that we collect in taxes and fees has to stay below that cap. If we collect more in taxes and fees than that cap allows, that money above the cap gets returned to us in the form of Tabor rebates. And so this referendum C chart right here is what I'm showing with my R. That's what grows by inflation plus population growth. And the bars represent the fees and taxes subject to that to the constraint. And you can see the Tabor surplus is all this money above the above the line, which are significantly a lot higher than they ever been since '92. To give you an idea, we gave almost 3.7 billion dollars back in 2022. Uh, the previous largest Tabor surplus was 941 back in 2000. So we gave Tabor surpluses in the last two years that were like four times as large as they've ever been. So a lot of money had to go back to taxpayers because Tabor says you've exceeded, you exceeded, exceeded the cap. It can't be spent on roads or schools. you got to give it back to taxpayers. Okay? And this is where those $750 checks come in. Basically, we were going to give a bunch of this money back in our taxes when we filed our taxes for 2022. The administration thought, you know, it'll be really good. Let's just mail checks to people before an election, because that's got to be sweet. <laughs> so it really wasn't new money. They didn't find $750 for everybody. We were going to get it back when we filed our taxes in April. They just sped it up and gave out mail checks in, in August. And that's why everyone got a $750 check. Or double if you file jointly. Okay. That's how we gave a big chunk of the money uh, when Tabor rebates in 2022. Uh, the first thing in line that, from, that gets funded out of Tabor rebates is the property tax break for seniors. That's that homestead exemption, which we'll talk about in a second. But we basically fund the property tax break for seniors out of the Tabor surplus first in line. So it was about 164 million that year. That was first in line to fund that. And then we returned $2.7 billion through those $750 checks. That was how a brunt of the money went back to us. And then still there was $800 million that went back through the six-tier sales tax. Basically, the mechanism that plays cleanup is a six-tier sales tax rebate that puts you into six tiers depending on your income. And there's a formula on how much each tier gets. So for instance, like there's your tiers this year. If you fall into the below 53,000, you're gonna get about $280 back this year. If there's your tiers, so that's basically the, the, the default, the current law mechanism by which we define, we, we define back Tabor surpluses is depending on where you fall on those tiers of your income, you'll get a portion of a Tabor rebate back. Well, they, they switched that mechanism for, to favor the $750 checks. And so that's how we gave back a lot of it in 2022. Now this year, you should have filed your taxes because they're due in about a week if you didn't file taxes. We were given about $3 billion. They decided to run a bill during the special session. Yeah. And they said, let's give everyone identical $800. So instead of instead of this mechanism where the more you earn, the higher you get, they said everyone gets 800 If you're a full-time resident working and file taxes as a full-time resident, everyone gets $800. If you did your turbo tax or you filed your taxes, everyone will get $800 across the board. As a check. Not a check. This is not a good, good question. They did mail checks. Which is actually costly. It costs money to mail. How much it costs to give back? Two and a half million or so, but <laughs> it's good politically. Just sign your name as a governor. You're set up. No, it's easier because when you do your taxes, it just comes off your taxes. Mm -hmm. and, and if you get a refund, then you get a check back. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's all already part of the process when you file your taxes. 
Yeah. But everyone, I, I'm loose with my words. Everyone didn't get an $800 check. They got an $800 identical rebate. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. So then you can see the Tabor rebates. This is the part of the bar that's above the, above the cap, right? Uh, it looks a lot less this next year than we've had in the last two years. Mm -hmm. But still, you're talking about you know first funding that property tax break for seniors, and we're still returning almost 1.6 billion. Um, if they didn't change anything, that 1.6 billion would go back, and this is the chart we'd be looking at. So depending on your income, you could get between 280 or 885 dollars per taxpayer. Now, this is probably going to change because one of the big fights of the capital this year is how to change how we give that money back. Um, the governor wants to cut the income tax further. Um, uh, part of the Democrats want to give a targeted tax credit to, for children, for low, in, for low income families that have children, as a way to give part of this table, part of this chunk, basically. Let's give targeted tax credits to child tax credits or earned income tax credits or cut the income tax. So I'm, I'm betting there's going to be a kind of a bargain of we'll probably cut the income tax a little bit and also pair it with like a low income tax credit, uh, particularly for families with kids. That's kind of table. That's the situation. That's why we got so much money back in the last two years, particularly. Okay. Now, more detail, make your head hurt is how we calculate our property taxes. So you don't pay property taxes on the entire value of your home, only the assessed value. So if you have a $550,000 home, you first take that market value times the assessment rate, that's statewide, to get your assessed value, which is about 36,000 in this example. And then your assessed value gets multiplied by your mills. You pay mills to your fire district, to your school district, to your county, to your city. You could be in a library district, a recreational district. Those are all your local governments are primarily property tax based. And those are your mills. Okay. How do they get that number, the 6.7%? How do they get Yeah, good question. That's all a product of Gallagher. The Gallagher Amendment, and this is my slot for your anticipating me. Nice. <laughs> Gallagher said in 1982, we don't want to be California. We're going to make sure our property taxes on our homes don't grow too much. And they said basically only 45% of all property taxes can come from homes. 55% have to come from non homes, basically everything else business, commercial. Um, that was the pie in 1982. And back then, that assessment rate was 21%. You saw it was currently 6.7. It was 21%. So a lot higher portion of our home was subject to those mills. What happened is the value of homes greatly outpaced the value of non-homes. And that, I think it's like a seesaw. That teeter-totter 55-45 was out of whack. Gallagher said you could only collect 45% from homes. As a way to make sure you only collect 45%, the rates on homes had to fall. Mm -hmm. So they fell to 18%, then 16, and 15. So they fell all the way to about just below 7%. And we recently lowered them, legislatively we lowered them as a way to give property tax break in the special session. And that special session in November. But that's basically one of the primary ways they, they lower your property taxes is by cutting that rate. But understand, it's kind of a product of 1982 Gallagher. And the league carried, carried petitions for Gallagher. Also. Yeah. And then we, well, we also had Gallagher in, on the vote in 2000. No, sorry, 2020. 2020 was COVID. And so the seesaw wasn't out of balance because homes were growing. The seesaw went goofy because no one was in commercial property. And oil and gas fell off the table because everyone was working from home. But take, uh, Gallagher said still, the pie shrank, we can only collect 45% of homes. So that rate was going to drop to like 5.8. They put get they put amendment on a proposition B, something something with a B on it. We basically voted to repeal the Gallagher Amendment in 2020. Okay. 
So that rate's not going to continue to fall if our homes grow too fast because we repealed the gap there in 2020. And that's part of the reason, you know, Gallagher would maybe have automatically given us a property tax break in the last several years, but we repealed the Gallagher. So what was on the books for several decades as a way to cut property taxes was repealed. That's part of the story why our rates have gone up significantly. Yes? So property taxes are related to your special districts like for the library, fire, and that kind yes. of thing. So is there is there any kind of compensation? I know what proposition was with HH wanted yeah. to compensate for that. So has there ever been any other mechanism to compensate when property taxes go down? Because we had to close our library for like several days a week because um because you lost money. Yeah, we lost money because it was a special district and it also impacted you know the fire department and other things. Yes, yeah, this, this is one of the complications with Gallagher. What, the weird part of Gallagher is that rate was is statewide. But the overall statewide pie grows too fast, we automatically cut the rate. So back in 2018, Denver grew by 40%. And then we cut the rate by 10%, but still Denver's fire district did well. The problem was Kremlin only grew by 5%, but the rate was cut by 10%. And you had a lot of rural districts that were getting, they were actually losing funding because of the Gallagher. It was like Denver's growth was screwing rural fire districts. That was one of the, one of the problems with why we repealed the gap, why the firefighters were particularly out front on that repeal, is because the rural firefighters were, were getting cut. Denver's fine. It was Denver's growth that was driving the overall cut. Uh, speaking of your point, a good rule of thumb is about 50% of property taxes are schools, about 20% are counties, the other 20% are special districts. So when you say special district, we're talking libraries and firefighters, EMTs, ambulances. But yeah, they're mostly property tax. And so that was another part of the story is that everyone's clamoring for property tax rate to our state legislators, but they don't really deal with the budgets of Montrose uh, Library. They deal with the general fund, but still they want to give property tax cuts. But if they get property tax cuts, they're impacting not their budget, their your library out here. And so that was part of Proposition HH, really complicated stuff, was is there a way that we will cut property taxes, but as a way to give state funding back so the rural, count, rural counties and libraries and fire districts didn't lose. Uh, that was another deeply detailed HH that made it even harder to explain to people. Uh, but to your point, that's, that, that, that is part of the discussion. When we do say we cut that assessment rate as a way to give property tax break, a lot of the rurals would like a backfill. Mm -hmm. But where do you get the money from the state? There's not a lot of room in the state general fund to just cut schools to give money back to a lot of fiber uh, to the library districts. And so part of HH, you know, to detail HH, part of HH was going to tap into some of this above the line, it was going to allow that, allow this, this cap to grow 1% faster. And so it was, it was going to allow the state to keep a little bit more of this bar, particularly in the future years. And they were going to use part of that money to then backfill your local governments. That was part of the big negotiation with HH. Yeah. Because then out there, the big important thing is to understand all property taxes are low. So when our state legislators goof with property taxes, they're impacting local governments, not their budgets, really. Why can they do that? Why can the state deal with the local the taxes? Good question. I guess that's part of the, yeah, part of Gallagher. That's how we how we assess our value of our, our, our things, yeah. And it would make it harder, like, okay, so Gallagher cuts the rate, but you can't raise your mills. The library can't go from two mills to three mills without a vote of people. Tabor, so Tabor kind of blocks part of Tabor so you can't raise rates. Yeah. Great question. So that's Gallagher in a nutshell. Now let's talk about the reason why, like, Montrose, Montrose the average Montrose was up by about 39%. From, Basically, when you got your property tax bill in 2023, 
your attack was up on average like 39% from two years prior. Understand that it wasn't because your mills went up. It's not like a library suddenly jacked up the taxes. They couldn't have unless you gave them voter permission to do that. So your mills didn't really go up. And this, this rate actually went down. It was 7%-ish, 7.15%. No, so this rate actually went down. Your mills probably stayed the same. The reason why your property taxes went up is because your value of your home went up 40% in two years. You know, some of the people who had $400,000 homes now had $700,000 homes, and they were paying a lot more property taxes. It was really the perfect storm on timing-wise because our property tax bills came out in May 23. Everyone was shocked. They're like 40% more. Well, how we calculate our assessed value is a two-year cycle. The first is two years worth of growth. That, that's always striking because the previous year there was no growth. That's always every two years that people are always like, oh, wow, that's more than last year. Well, okay, it's capped at two years. But the big part was most of the gr growth in housing value happened exactly during that two-year assessment period. That two-year assessment period basically ended from, went from May 2020 to May 2022. It was basically, and th this, this chart shows the Case-Shiller Index. It's a index of housing prices. Just to illustrate all the growth, like look how steep the growth was during that great two-year assessment period. Basically, it was a perfect storm of like, property taxes were assessed at a peak, huge growth in those two years. And they actually you know, fell about 15% after you know, in these two years. But still your property tax break, property tax in 23 are based on this period where prices really went up across the state, crazy in Denver, but really crazy everywhere. Sure. Including Montrose. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of people, you know, try to um, attest their property taxes. A lot of county, county commissioner, uh, county assessors spent a lot of time in 2023 to arguing whether you really had three bathrooms and ran county bucks or whatever, or whatever. But it's because the market value has gone up. And so everyone's clamming for property tax rate, property tax rates. But understand if the state legislators cut property taxes, it doesn't impact them. It impacts your library and your county. Uh, still overall, I mean, our property taxes are super low. If you look at how much we pay as a percentage of the value of our home. Uh, this is the latest rankings. If you had a $530,000 home, you on average pay about $2,400 in property taxes. Um, if you move that $530,000 home to Texas, you pay off $7,700. But by comparison, we have very low property taxes. People are, are just shocked because the sticker shock that it's gone up so much in the last two years. Jersey's the highest, if you're curious. Mm. Get the exact same home in Denver and Colorado and pay $2,400, you pay almost $11,000 in Jersey. Mm. Okay. Let's talk about the homestead for a second. Now, as part of the property tax discussion, uh, we have the thing called the homestead exemption. Uh, if you're 65 and older and lived in your home for 10 years, you qualify for this property tax break. It's about $600 on average. Um, basically, what they do, instead of more multiplying your value, 560 times the assessment rate times your mills, you get to take off $100,000 of value right off the top. So your formula, if you have the homestead, starts at 460 and then gets multiplied by the assessment rate times your mills. And this is the one where there is a backfill. So Montrose Library doesn't lose money for every person who has the homestead because the state backfills Montrose Library for the $600 tax credit that the homestead gave each individual. So the homestead does have a mechanism to backfill the lost revenue to local governments. And that comes out of Tabor excesses. Uh, it can. In years there's Tabor surplus where the bar is above the cap, it can come out of there. In years where we're below the cap, it comes out of general. <laughs> yeah. So it competes with schools essentially. In years we don't have Tabor surpluses, and some years they can zero. 
uh, and like last recession, they actually zeroed it. They did not give a homestead break for several years back in 2009 or 10. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the homestead. One of the issues, the homestead we hear a lot is it passed in 2000. That was back when you could take 100,000 off and the average home was 160. Now the average home is 560 and you can still only take 100 off. And so it's basically not even close to keeping up with inflation or you know rapid tripling of housing prices. And so there's a lot of people who love, who love to modernize or update that homestead exemption uh, to make it worth more. Another piece people would love to hear would, would make it portable. So right now, if you down, if you had your homestead, you've been living there for 20 years, you've benefited from this property tax break. If you move, downsize. You have to wait 10 years to get it again. Oh. And so there's a lot of people that would love to make it portable. That was there was there was a provision in HH that would make would have made the homestead portable if that giant HH thing would have passed. There's a there's currently a bill in the legislature that would uh would update this and basically triple it. I don't I don't know where that bill is right now. Mm -hmm. Is it a standalone or is it gonna be that bill standalone bill? Yeah. You have UC negotiations. Huh. I wouldn't be surprised but it's a huge negotiated bill where they do table rebates and they, they do the homestead portability thing or, or maybe change the homestead. If they can do that with the signal subject. That's always been a topic. Basically, it should be, I mean, if you want to keep up with the price of housing, it should be updated. But understand, if you would do that, that's less table rebate than I would get because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we don't take part of that bar, right? Bar above the cap. Okay. Any questions on the homestead? You can't talk taxes without at least mentioning cannabis taxes. Everyone always asks about recreational cannabis. Uh, we started taxing it in 2014. So we've had 10 years worth of uh, cannabis taxes. This year we collected about 370 million. Just to give an idea how much came from recreational cannabis. The general fund that year was 17.6. So it's about 2%, not nearly as much as people think. Not nearly, nearly the pot of gold people think it is. Um, but that money doesn't go to the general fund, it goes to another source. But just to give an idea of how big it is. Um, we actually collected less this year than the previous two years. Is it going to be legalized recreational cannabis? The next year we collected more than the previous year, then more than the previous year, and then COVID hit and we collected even more than the previous year. And now we're finally starting to level off in total collections of cannabis. We were so close to collecting 420, and that's like a lot number. 424. I was so close. I made a joke like if there was like a plot head at the Department of Revenue and they hit 420, I'm like, December 27th, they would be like, turn, turn, turn the taxes off. Yeah. Turn them off. Let's collect exactly four twenty. But most of that, uh, about a hundred million goes to schools. Um, doesn't really pay for teachers. It, it, it more pays for capital construction. There's a thing called the Best Fund, Building Excellent Schools Today. It's basically a capital construction fund that puts new system, ventilation systems, boilers. Safer playgrounds, asbestos removal, stuff like that. So a lot, a lot of the marijuana that goes to schools goes to capital construction. It doesn't really pay for teachers as much. I wonder if we got twenty million for that. Or you might have it if you if you got a best grant. There's a process where you have to put up matching money. Like you might have to match forty percent of it, and then the marijuana kicks in sixty. Like there's a whole formula. So there's all yeah, it's a, it's a grant project. You have to plot on why. You can have text message poison control because of those marijuana dollars. It is anti-bullying stuff last year with some of those dollars. But I mean, the school budget is like 13 billion. So we're not like we're funding our whole school, our K-12 education from plot money. There's just give an idea of other sin taxes. Alcohol, tobacco, we call sin taxes. Uh, for several years, we used to collect a lot more marijuana than we did in tobacco and nicotine. Mm -hmm. 
Now we recently passed EE, which raised the cigarette tax and vaping taxes. So we're gonna collect more tobacco taxes this year than in marijuana again. Okay. So to give you a background, just to, if you're not read the book, then we've got the Cliff Notes version. Here's my Chris Notes version of HH. My HH presentation was like 45 minutes because it was super complicated. I just want to give you a quick background of HH and why it didn't pass and understanding why our property taxes are going to go up unless legislators do something about property taxes and why we're probably going to see something in November that's going to drastically cut property taxes or put another, put another property tax cap on the books. Um, so HH was a big property tax cut. It was going to lower the assessment rate and also exempt about $50,000 of everyone's money. So it's similar to the homestead in that aspect. Everyone gets to take $50,000 off. The assessment rate was going to fall. Okay. That was the big property tax part of HH. The second part was that the, that taper cap was going to be allowed to grow by an extra 1%. So it was a compounding effect. So in the future, it was probably going to eat a lot of our taper rebates. And they were going to use that, that extra money the state could keep. Part of it was to backfill local governments for those property tax cuts. Um, and there was some for affordable housing. It was super complicated. Um, it created a local property tax, super complicated. It also made that homestead exemption affordable, part of the homestead conversation. So it was a whopping bill. It was like a Super Bowl of explaining fiscal policy. Um, super complicated. It didn't get, I don't know, 33%. didn't not even come close to pass. Uh, a lot of people didn't want to give up their taper checks, their taper refunds for a property tax cut. It was a trade off. Um, but as, as, a, as HH failed, then legislators say, hey, property taxes are the number one thing on voters' minds. Bills are up on average 40%. So we got to figure out how to give them property tax relief. That's why they called the legislators back in November and had a special session. Part of that special session then lowered that rate to 6.7 for only one year, though. We basically did like one year worth of relief. And it took some, I think, some value off the time. They basically did Prop HH for one year under a bill of special session, but that was just one year. So the question is, are they going to do something with property tax relief this year at the end, you know, in the next month or two? Because um, if not, there's already uh, a, a property tax cap as, as qualified for the bottom of the ballot. Um, uh, in, in presidential election years, we always have long ballots because we have all the stuff on the bottom of the ballot. Sometimes we see amendments, sometimes we see propositions, just in our, sometimes we see CZs, sometimes we see numbers. Just for your own learning, rule of thumb, if you see a number, that means it came through the citizens initiative process. So if someone bugged people outside the grocery store to sign their petition and they got 150,000 signatures and got on the ballot through the citizens initiative. If it has a letter, it came from our legislators. Our legislators ran a bill through the Capitol and they said, let's refer this to voters. Okay, so letter is legislator, number is citizens initiative. If it has an amendment in it, it gets locked into our constitution. It makes it a lot harder to change. If it has proposition, it just changes a law. And laws can be changed every year, you know. Legislators can run a new law and negate a law. So a proposition doesn't have nearly the, you know, the long-term effects. They don't get locked into the Constitution. But four things have qualified so far. A lot more will probably make the ballot once signatures were gathered. You know, last several years, we've had a dozen things on the bottom of our ballots, from wolves to <laughs> everything. Um, one of the things that's already qualified would be a 4% cap on property taxes. Uh, so I think overall property taxes will only be allowed to grow by four percent, and then we'll figure out how to cut property taxes if if, if property grows more than four percent. That's one of the things I know is already qualified to make the ballot um, that we'll see on the bottom of the ballot this year. And so it's interesting that for me to figure out our legislators going to try to cut property taxes somehow with a bill this year, you know, before the legislative session ends. Um, to hedge against getting a new Gallagher-type thing on the books or not. 
That's kind of the, what's the uh, interesting part of fiscal policy right now. Uh, but we'll decide on a property tax, a statewide property tax cap in uh, November. Okay. Before I finish the, for general questions, I just want to give a shout out to, I've been teaching microeconomics at AAM for eight years. Uh, and I've come up with a lot of examples, 18 year olds interested in 8 a.m. Uh, I worked with a cartoonist and I took uh, five years to write my book. Uh, and finally, I got published two, a couple of months ago. So if anyone's interested in checking out my economics book, a goofy guide to learning microeconomics with a bunch of cartoons and goofy examples, uh, I sell these for 20. And then we also have the purple book, is our Colorado Fiscal Institute book for $20. It has a bunch of infographics, like some of the slides you saw on how school finance works, how oil and gas property tax works, how cannabis taxes work, where we rank in taxes, everything quick fiscal infographics in our purple book that I sell as well. Uh -huh. So with that, questions? Uh -huh. How long are your books good for? <laughs> <laughs> Before everything changes. <laughs> yeah. We we uh update this every two years. Okay. That way we get all the new tax ranking, you know, all the new school finance updates, all our, you know, what we've done with the state budget, what we did with Tabor, what we did on the ballot. We update that book every two years. This is just gold, this is good forever. This is... <laughs> <laughs> my online dating chapter is good forever. <laughs> Um, is it possible to describe what the color budget would look like if there was no table ever? Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, you can see it's a history of Tabor of the city. Would the schools be in better positions? You know, a lot of it, I'll argue that um, the schools would be in a lot better positions, but not because we were able to keep more of that Tabor revenue. Uh, the real, um, <clears throat> let's just say, I mean, yeah, we've given back a couple hundred million dollars, not every year, but I mean, how many, 10 years out of the last 30? So it's not like all the money, it's not like the state kept our table rebate, we'd be better funding our general fund. I'll argue that um, schools are hurting because mills used to be a lot higher. And because Tabor says every school district could only grow by inflation for population, if you grew too fast, your mills automatically got cut. Mm -hmm. So on average, mills for schools when Tabor passed was like 39 statewide. Mills now are 19. Mm -hmm. So part of the deeper part of Tabor's impact on schools is how it's, it automatically cut the mills on, in the school district. Um, and superintendent didn't care because you saw that the school funding pie, the state just gave them more money. So it was a weird interaction where, like, hey, what the hell, Cherry Creek? You're cutting your mills and the state's giving you more? That was a weird autopilot of, of Tabor's interaction with the school finance formula that I would argue is a bigger impact on schools than the Tabor surplus. So if you ever hear the term mill stabilization or anything like that, that's that correction they're trying to make because some of these districts that grew too, they grew faster, they got cut, they didn't lose funding. The state gave them more. But it was a weird autopilot. Um, so basically they ran a bill and said everyone has to get back to 27 mills. The Randall, you're at six, that's bullshit. <laughs> you got to inch your mill back up because the state's giving you too much. That, that this is a really detailed, this is the hour-long school finance lecture that they <laughs> did. Well, it sounds like a super mess, <laughs> and it somehow always all works out, I guess. And, and I, I mean, they have to balance the budget every year. It's not like we can borrow money. Like the federal government has national debt, right? They can run up a tab, and we can, we have to balance our budgets every year. But we typically we balance them on state cuts to education. And I mean, last recession, no, I would argue. Yeah. If Montrose decided to give the schools more money, 
and what the null levy is. Could they do that? Or are they restricted to it? They're restricted on other MIPS. They have to, they couldn't raise, they can't raise taxes about those people. They're not raising taxes, but if they took some of the general fund and put it towards schools. Oh, so the city of Montrose gave to schools. I don't know if they could do that. I never heard of that because it's different. It's not like the school is part of the general fund of the city, it's a completely different local government. Well, you, you should be able to remember cutting the library down to, you know, what, four days a week? Yeah, yeah. Because of the military situation, so if the county or the city had decided to put some money from the I, I mean, I mean, students are good. I mean, schools accept donations. <laughs> I mean, I mean, what it is. I, I, I would think you have to go like a donation or something like that. But well, if they did that to schools, then with the, and it was legal, would the state then cut what they're giving? Oh, no, good question. So I think your question is, would your pie get used up if, if you got more local? No. This pie, think of the pie as a school finance formula, and think of another chunk of money as, as a different pie. This is often I refer to as the override pie. So a lot of school districts said, hey, we got cut in 2010. Let's go to our voters in Boulder. Boulders will raise three mills and then we'll collect all that extra money. That didn't impact Boulder's pie. Think of it as a separate pot of money. That's the really, the, I would argue, the disparity across districts is the districts that have property wealth or have the voter uh, yes to raise them. There's an extra $2.9 in override. So these are your elections like vote yes on 5 e you see a lot of these like yard signs when you drive across the state in, in the fall. Those are outside of, think of that outside of form. Because otherwise it'd be stupid, right? You would raise your money locally, but you'd lose state. And no one would do it. Whether or not, interesting legal question. I don't know if the state, if the city of Montrose gave into here, would that do for Montrose's pie? I don't know. I'll fall, I would love to follow up with that. I have a couple lawyers that would give you a. That's a really good question. It's county school, not city. Well, it's a school district, though, yeah. So the yeah. county budget is your school district, which is the county. But then it's also the city. They're all three separate local entities. Mm -hmm. Good question. In Los Angeles, we had um, parent groups that became a booster club for a specific school, and they don't to the register plan. They donated a bunch of money to the school that way. Yeah. You see that too with PTA, some of the bigger PTA, yeah. like I joke, but like Boulder has like kombucha sales instead yeah. of brownish sales. <laughs> yeah, that's another part. Okay. But it's a lot smaller. Charming. This big school districts are millions and millions of dollars. So you know, fifty thousand dollars. Not it looks like the, the overall funding pie. We we'll worked off this joke by though, but <laughs> my one friend had her cat. She didn't read my book yet, but she sent me this photo. Uh, uh, I just think of and uh, her cat Johnson passed away last night. You take a photo of this real quick. Don't make her a day, because I'll show her. Her, her cat. Sure. Just a, <laughs> yeah, she hadn't read my book, but her cat was sleeping on the book. I think it'd be better if you brought a cat with you. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a contest on the, the best captions. Here's the top three captions. If you want to add one of the captions to my book talk deck, here's the top three I got so far. Economics by Os Meowsis. <laughs> it's not, it's not economic joke, but yeah. Biology joke, not bad. This is more wonky economics. Talk about perfect competition. <laughs> perfect competition is a my perfect term. Here's the best one. Economics joke. I thought you said lazy fair. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> so you have another one. Let me know. And my contact, yeah, if you have other questions. My last name is uh, Stifler. There's my contact. 
Hey, Rose, I'll, I'll, I'll be hanging out. And if anyone wants to pick up a copy of either of my books, more than welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Thanks so much for it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad I'm